What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're having a great day, morning, noon, night, whatever it is for you guys. Hope you're having the best that you can possibly be having right now. And if you're new here, guys, well, we're just all happy and peachy you're here with us. Now, guys, if you're an OG to the channel, you can already tell. This is a whole brand new setup for you guys, and I am super duper excited because we've been pumping out some crispy videos for you guys now. But bear with me, guys. I'm changing editing software. Software is completely, hardware is completely different. So bear with me for a second as we get up to par and get over that little learning curve. But with that being said, guys, we're going to do a, a nice little short video for you today. But we're going to be talking about some Warhammer for you guys, y'all's favorite. We're going to be getting back into some West Hammer. And guys, you know that he loves to talk about those freaking bugs. God, I hate bugs. If you don't know why, guys, I'll, I'll link a video in the description for you that'll explain everything. But bugs, remember last time, guys, I had to kill a spider in the middle of the video. That thing was, okay, it wasn't as big as my hand, but it, it about about this big. Ugh, I hate spiders. But with that being said, guys, let's go ahead and get into this. Wes Hammers, the Tyranids. Wow. Ready? The 40K universe is an incredibly dark place. Yeah. It's filled you with some say. horrifying characters and stories. Now, potentially, one Freaking of the most terrifying bugs. species in the entire galaxy is that of the Tyranids themselves. An unthinking, Spiders. unquestioning swarm of Bugs. reptilians of Lovecraftian yeah. monsters that descend upon unsuspecting worlds and strip them of all life, rendering everything organic into a slurry of biological Gosh. matter that they can then use to create what more was monsters. To, make to say that the Tyranids are horrifying is a massive understatement, but today yeah. we're gonna you be examining say. five different stories that show just how scary they truly are. From an organism that kills its prey in hey, the most yes, horrific Cthulhu way imaginable, Jr. to a horrific short story that shows what it's like to be eaten and alive looks by like a continent-sized hive tremor. ship. And speaking of eating, this video sponsor knows a thing or two about good food. So a quick shout out to them, and then we're going to dive headfirst into the grimdark. The terror of the Melanthrope. So to it's kick Cthulhu this video Jr. off, we're going to start guys? with something that isn't exactly a story. It's more a specific Tyranid organism. One whose description is absolutely chilling. So what the Melanthrope is a relatively heck? newly discovered Tyranid species, often confused with its smaller cousin, the Zonthrope. It is what? a bizarre creation that seems to serve the purpose of collecting and organizing different forms of genetic material for the high fleets. It does this in order for the fleet to gain new insight into how to create ever more horrifying new bioforms. They take the role of a battlefield researcher or scientist uh, rather than a warrior species, much like how the Drukhari homunculi will often take to the battlefield in search of new specimens to take back to their hellish and depraved laboratories for experimentation. What? No one really knew these things existed for the longest time because their role dictated that they would only appear when the Tyranids had been successful in their attack. If humanity was able to fight off the Tyranid invasion, then there would be no reason for a Melanthrope to appear. Meaning for centuries, anyone who witnessed one of these hellish creatures didn't survive to give a report. The way the Melanthrope kills their prey is what makes them so what? disturbing. Once it has you in its grasp, it will inject you with a truly terrifying venom that is cardiotoxic, neurotoxic, and dermonecrotic. The venom causes waves of excruciating pain to pulse through the victim's body and eventually completely disable them. The Melanthrope then takes the unlucky creature. I'm going to end. Stop it right there, guys, because... That, that, that kind of felt like what the Black Widow bite did. Yeah, yeah. I don't. My flesh didn't start falling off, but my heart was definitely affected. My nerves were definitely affected, and came to find out the hard way. I'm allergic to morphine. How did I find out? They gave me a bunch of morphine. Yeah, they tried to kill me. Let's keep going with these bugs, you guys. ...creature into the bloated sacs around its torso, where the victim's genetic material will slowly be extracted and processed. To be captured alive by one of these creatures is to be subjected to a horrific and painful existence. Kinda and worst sounds of like all, to not be allowed to die, as it slowly digests you and tears you apart molecule by molecule, atom by atom, every individual piece of you being absorbed and cataloged. 
you can think of the Melanthrope as a living organic jail cell that's also part that. torture chamber and research lab. At any given time, it can have dozens of different victims inside the mini sacks covering its body, each one slowly being absorbed. The worst part about being captured what? by one of these things is to know that you will face untold agonies without even the hope of death to give you comfort. As to have been captured by a Melanthrope no, thank you. means that there are no defenders left alive that could possibly free you from its clutches. The Unknown Prisoner of the Xenos Bestiarium. The Within Zenos the infamous Xenos Bestiarium of the Death Watch are held captive aliens that have been kept under lock and key in order to be better studied. These prisoners are relentlessly subjected to invasive tests by the members of its apothecaria, whether that be through dissection and examination to learn the anatomical secrets of how to better destroy members of their species in the future, or to be released into the hunting grounds for the Death Watch to hone their skills against. This is a dark and secretive place where any secrets an alien may possess will be extracted from it by force. Over the years, the Bestiarium has housed hundreds of thousands of different aliens, and each and every one of them has been categorized by different threat levels, spanning from infrared to ultraviolet. The Bestiarium is home to an unparalleled uh. level of knowledge, and thus, Inquisitors are known to frequent here in order to gain valuable insight into their own investigations. Amongst the various holding cells within the Bestiarium, one of them seemingly remains empty, but has been placed at threat level ultraviolet indicating that whatever Ultra is inside violent. is considered by the Death Watch to be one of the most dangerous threats in the galaxy. It is kept in Zone Violet, which is maximum security taken to a whole new level. A breach of this area would be absolutely catastrophic, and the nightmarish monsters that can be found here can never be allowed to escape. Whatever this thing is, it was captured on the sometimes described as haunted world of Jove's Descent in 814M41. A Death Watch kill team had gone to the planet to investigate numerous suspicious disappearances. They set up a stasis trap in an area they believed was the logical hunting ground of whatever was responsible for the disappearances. Several days later, they returned to find that the trap had been sprung and it registered that something was in fact inside of it. However, upon investigation, the Death Watch anything. kill team could detect no creature inside of the stasis field. Puzzled, they sought to determine if there was a malfunction with the trap's it's machine It's like spirit, an indominus but rigs. everything seemed to be fully operational. The kill team transferred it unopened to the Xenos Bestiarium for further study. Even upon expert examination, whatever was inside was completely invisible and unable to be detected by even the most sensitive equipment that the Death Watch had. Just to be safe, the trap itself was sealed inside one of the cells and placed under maximum security. It was then that the trap was intentionally allowed to fail in order to bait the creature out. This, however, proved to be unsuccessful as whatever was inside was exceptionally cunning and intelligent. They theorized that it was most likely a member of the Tyranid species, based upon the planet's location in space, and that it was likely a form of Lictor or Gene Stealer, which had absolutely perfect camouflaging abilities, chameleonic powers that are believed to be psychic away. in nature. Whatever this thing was, it was somehow able to prevent the human mind from registering its presence when viewed directly or through even the most fine-tuned augers and sensors that the Imperium possessed. Hmm. They theorized that it was also possible that whatever was inside had evolved to be able to literally phase in and out of existence. I was about to say, which, so it's not true, changing the wavelength would give the creature the ability to walk unhindered through solid walls, God, meaning that the trap itself like and Cthulhu. even its holding cell would be viewed as a childish and primitive construct to this entity that it remained I inside of itself see the simply for its own uh, amusement. Influence. Paranoia on what this thing was, or if there even was anything inside the trap at all, had grown more fevered over the years. Many members of the Death Watch have volunteered to sacrifice themselves, willingly entering the chamber unarmed to bait the creature into attacking them. But as of today, the Chamber of Vigilance is still weighing its options on what to do. The Doom of Malantai. The creature known as the Doom of Melanti was a uniquely adapted Tyranid Zomethrope that managed to bring down an entire craft world, mostly single-handedly. And the way it did this is not only terrifying, what? but has enormous implications on the future of the Tyranid species. So first, a little backstory on the craft world of Melanti itself. Okay. So the craft worlds of Melanti, Iandan, and Idhara had formed an Melanti? alliance with one another. They encountered a splinter of High Fleet Behemoth that would later become known as a High Fleet in its own right, High Fleet Naga, or the Endless Winding Serpent to the Eldar. It had encroached on one of the largest and most prosperous of the Exodite worlds. The three craft worlds sent fleets to help them fend it off, they can't exterminate but when they them. arrived, the planet had almost been completely overrun. Its world spirit had been consumed, and most of its population was already dead. Determined to enact their vengeance, have that they launched mass. an all-out assault on the greater bioships, 
for it was believed that if those ships were destroyed, the rest of the fleet would not be able to function. Even though the Eldari took enormous losses, they were eventually successful. The bio ships were destroyed, and all of the smaller Tyranid vessels became uncoordinated and reverted back into an animalistic nature. Over the coming years, the united okay. force of Eldari would dedicate themselves entirely to cleansing the sector of all of the leftover Tyranids, eventually believing and celebrating that they had been completely wiped out. And although for the Eldar, this was a bittersweet moment you're of wrong. celebration, it was ultimately premature as the Eldari of Craftworld Melanti would suffer a truly horrific fate. For although it seemed Naga had been completely wiped out, there remained a lone and the wounded bioship, which would launch a bundle of myetic spores towards Craftworld Melanti That's in a, a final ship. act of animalistic hatred and malice. Once embedded into the Craftworld surface, the spores would unleash untold waves of Tyranid horrors. Although not a huge fighting force in its own right, any amount of Tyranids suddenly appearing where they're not expected is a critical situation. A the Eldari aboard the craft yeah, world dedicated all of their attention boy. to hunting down the largest creatures, as they posed the greatest threat, and it was believed that they would have the strongest link to the hive mind. This, however, Probably was a fatal mistake, them. as these creatures were nothing but a distraction from a far more terrifying entity, a single Zonthrope, that would later become known as the Doom of Melanti. Now, a normal Zonthrope is scary enough. What They're a especially Zonthrope? designed Tyranid organism created from harvested Eldar DNA. They're basically oh. a giant floating brain. The creature is so solely dedicated to the purpose of being a psychic conduit that its limbs are grotesquely underdeveloped, and it's only able to move like by levitating itself. Arms. Looks can be deceiving, because a Zonthrope is capable of raining down enormous levels of destruction single-handedly, shooting concentrated blasts of warp energy He's shooting that destroy hyper beams even the out of his of forehead. Arms while raining down scattered bolts of psychic power to obliterate large hordes of Psyker infantry in hyper seconds. Beams. Whether by design or an instance of freak mutation, the Doom of Melanti was able to feast upon and absorb not just the physical essence of living creatures in the form of biomass, but in their spiritual essence as well. This entity was able to literally eat souls. The creature made its way to the heart of the craft Sucks your biomass circuit, and Which, your if you're unfamiliar with, is like a massive repository of Eldar what? souls. When the Eldar are killed in battle, if they are wearing a soul stone, the stone is able to absorb their absorb psychic their imprint, soul. thus preventing it from going screaming into the warp, where it would inevitably be devoured by Slanesh. If their allies are able to get the stone back to the ship mm, and Slanesh. plug it into the Infinity Circuit, then the spirit will be able to roam freely through the wraithbone structure of the craft world. The collective spirits of the Eldari dead act like a massive reservoir of psychic energy, but also as a guiding force for the living as the group consciousness of ancient Eldari can offer wisdom and guidance to their kin. This is one of the main reasons why the Eldar fight so fiercely to defend their craft worlds. Because if one of them ends up getting destroyed, it's not just them losing their home, but all of the souls of their ancestors as well. Drawn like a moth to flame, the Doom of Melanti infiltrated the Infinity Circuit and gorged itself on oh, the Eldar souls, that can be feasting good. like a hungry scavenger that's come across an unprotected <laughs> nest to plunder. It ate and ate and grew more and more powerful and with every and ancient and soul it devoured. And 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 In a mocking twist of fate, those who had been saved from being devoured by Slanesh were now being consumed by an equally voracious predator. By the time the creature had been discovered, it was far too late, as Melanti's imminent death had been made manifest. It was said that the doom of Melanti was nearly invincible. It was able to snap the Eldari wraith constructs in half with but a thought and send out waves of crippling destructive energy that tore the ship's wraithbone structure apart. It rained down cataclysmic bolts of stolen psychic power and pulped entire armies of Eldar warriors in seconds. With what? the exception of a few survivors who managed to escape, everything else was destroyed and consumed by the creature. The Eldar souls ripped from their body while they were still just alive. The no one either. knows what happened to this creature, as after the craft world had been killed, it seemingly disappeared and it very well may still be out there. Oh, or possibly, it, it could have been reconsumed by the hive mind, its ridiculous abilities becoming part of its greater consciousness, staring into the eyes of the hive mind. The battle known as the Devastation of Ball was when High Fleet Leviathan had made its way all the way to the homeworld of the Blood Angels, in one of the most devastating invasions the planet the had ever Angels. seen. This is all detailed in the appropriately named novel, Devastation of Ball. So I definitely oh, recommend okay. checking that out if you're a fan of Blood Angels or Tyranids. The novel itself I think isn't necessarily that scary. To me. It's a good old-fashioned Space Marine war story, but there was one scene in particular that I found uniquely unnerving. During the invasion, the Blood Angels are attempting to set a trap for the Tyranids, 
they have uh -huh. constructed a moat around a fortified position and have filled it with what they Smart refer to as kids. thirst water. Thirst water looks like ordinary water, but it hides a much more terrifying property. For you see, it sure isn't water at all. Thirsty. In fact, it's alive, composed of quintillions of individual organisms. The thirst water lures in its prey with promises of offering refreshment. And as soon as the victim touches it, it begins to consume them, immediately sucking out all of the moisture of the creature, killing it in a pretty horrific manner. The nature of thirst water is still unknown, whether it was native to Baal Secundus, an ancient weapon of the Dark Age of technology, or a Xeno's creation that had gotten loose. Guys, Whatever the case, hammer, so the Blood grim. Angels had gathered all of it that Everything they could find and were keeping it secure on Baal. The Thirstwater's exact nature made it difficult to study, but it was obvious that it was one of the system's most deadly substances. If the Thirstwater had managed to escape, it would seep into the sands of Baal, separating into infinite organisms that would spread across the planet and wreak untold devastation. Could the Tyranids The idea of that? using it as a weapon was unthinkable, but this was Baal's darkest hour. The battle that was taking place around the sanctuary was of an unconceivable scale. Trillions of Tyranids rampaged across Baal's surface, while uncountable spores descended from the upper atmosphere, delivering ever more deadly payloads of Tyranid monstrosities. Pieces of ships and massive chunks of flesh fell from the sky, remnants of the void battle taking place above them. Hordes of unorganized gaunts rampaged towards the structure, while the Space Marines and the human defenders of Baal fired wave upon wave of shots into them, tearing them apart. They couldn't allow the lesser probing Tyranids to reach the moat. It would ruin the element of surprise, and thus the advantage ruin that the, the Thirst trap. Water would provide them. As more and more of the larger Tyranids showed up, the unorganized frenzy of the Gaunts slowly got more and more disciplined, as the hive mind's influence grew stronger and stronger. Instead of a random pattern of attacks, the swarm grew larger and more sentient, its tendrils reaching out and probing for weakness. Their numbers formed into solid ranks in their tens of thousands, the moving first. as one towards the perimeter, marching over the destroyed bodies of the other Tyranids. Eventually, the Tyranid numbers reached a critical mass, and the Blood Angels gave the order for everyone to fall back into the sanctuary. The moment was at hand for the Thirst Water Trap to be sprung, a wall of Tyranids so thick that it was impossible to tell where one creature ended and another began. I have a feeling this up is not going to be good. Moment, but they didn't pursue. Something was wrong. The chaplain pressed forward, standing in defiance of the Tyranid horde, and shouted at them, Xenos, I am Ordemail, Paternus Sanguinus of the Blood Angels, second only to beloved Astaroth the Grim. Fight me. By the blood, come to my Crozius and accept my blessing. By the Tyranids the were only about 300 feet away and were separated by the moat. They stood motionless and unblinking. Beneath their feet was a collecting pool of Tyranid blood, that was inching closer and closer to the thirst water. Among the sea of infinite gaunts, one stood aside, looking down, watching the blood with suspicious curiosity. It then looked up directly into the face of the chaplain, their eyes meeting. He had stared into the cold black eyes of thousands of these creatures before, this but none of them met his gaze quite like this one. Something was deeply wrong with this gaunt. Would there was something attached to this creature, something enough. truly ancient. As the intelligent as it was cruel, back the chaplain you. was staring directly into the eyes of the hive mind itself, an ancient alien See, god of impossible intelligence and infinite cruelty. A being that could control infinite swarms of tyranids across infinite battlefields had chosen to stare out of the eyes of this single gaunt. The impossible weight of its presence pressed on the chaplain's psyche and made him real. If he had been a lesser man, Staring into the eyes of a god like this would have driven him instantly Broke insane. Him. But the chaplain was no lesser man. He was, he was a, a space marine. He was and he a space knew no marine. fear. He raised his no bolt fear. pistol and fired a single shot, None. causing the gaunt's head to detonate. The death of the gaunt was the pebble taken from the dam that causes it to collapse. The hordes of Tyranids fell forward in screeching thousands, pushed on only by their instinct to kill and the weight of the massive horde behind them. It's they plunged into the water, dying, shrieking in their thousands, their chitinous skeletons surfacing momentarily as a bleached bone reef before sinking back down. The moat nearly filled okay. with Tyranids, that's, but in yeah, the end, the Blood Angels managed to survive, as the majority of the Tyranids were killed, while many of the larger beasts ended up falling back. The battle had been won, but the war for Ball was long from was over. So this moment, where a space marine stared into the face of a god, this ancient alien creature, looking at him with nothing more than idle curiosity. An insect, a specimen that, compared to itself, was utterly pathetic and insignificant. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into this moment, but, but to me this represented it? that true alien Lovecraftian horror 
that encapsulates the Tyranids so beautifully that this universe is brutal, alien, and ultimately unforgiving. That there are impossible intelligences out there, obscured by the void of space, entities so utterly alien that they are completely unrecognizable and incomprehensible to mortal minds. Truly ancient beings of impossible power and eldritch horror that see us as nothing more than an oddity to be consumed. That the true nature of the, the Tyranids oddities? in the hive mind is so utterly alien and inconceivable that there is no way to relate or even begin to process them. That the great empire of humanity are thousands upon thousands of years of innovation, history, culture, and conquest. Our remarkable feats of technological advancement and the countless yeah. strides we have made to taming an uncaring universe. Our individual unique stories, as well as the greater epic that is the journey of the human race as a whole, is nothing more than food for the swarm. You're just In the eyes of that gun, the Space Marine saw something terrifying. Not anger, wrath, or even murderous intent, as those are human emotions. In the wake of untold devastation across infinite battlefields, this creature, who had killed and consumed untold trillions, in its eyes, the chaplain saw only uncaring indifference. The unknown, the utter inability to comprehend something like this, That's is what toe. makes the Tyranids what this is to me. so terrifying to me. Eaten alive by a hive ship. To close this video out, I want to share with you a passage from the novel The Last Hunt by Robbie McNevin. Robbie managed to capture something that we don't often get to see in the 40k universe. True, unrelenting horror. The Tyranids are absolutely horrifying, but what? unfortunately, it's often made difficult to truly appreciate that, as these stories are normally told from the perspective of superhuman warriors clad in power armor. Even when it's told from the perspective of a guardsman, they're normally highly trained men and women, at the very least equipped with military-grade weaponry. This particular passage has none of that, and shows just how horrific the Tyranids truly are. The story depicts what it's like to be eaten alive by a Tyranid hive ship. Now, I don't normally do this in my videos, but I am gonna offer a bit of a warning here. This story is kind of disturbing and kind of messed me up for like a whole day after I read it. I'm gonna read the passage in its original writing, let's but I have omitted some of the more graphic depictions. Why? And with that out of the way, Wes. let's get into the grimdark. Come on, man. The Vanguard Xenos bioships had passed by. JUF D19 Rimward was now at the heart of their fleet. And compared to the organic drones that had quested around the main swarm, the true organisms of the high fleet were behemoths. behemoths. Daverick's mind struggled to comprehend what he was seeing as he took in sheets of pockmarked chitin the size of small continents and toothed Aye. orifices the size of cities. The thick clusters of tendrils along its flank and underbelly writhed in the solar winds while its maw was encompassed by two great wicked beak-like bone plates that looked as though they could have sheared an imperial capital ship. That sounds in half. like the um And the worst thing about this the aliens, Leviathan the Xenos was that it was coming straight towards Iron the Man. Augur station. Oh Avengers. God, Emperor, Ankum stammered over and over. Corday was quietly sobbing, his head in his hands. Serene just stared, the image on the view screen reflected in her wide, dark eyes. Only Crassus turned away from the display. What? He walked over to the worn leather of his command chair, paused, tugged his dark blue sensorium master's uniform straight, and sat down. His expression was unreadable, jaw locked, though in the harsh emergency lumens, he looked more haggard than ever. Crew members, he said, his words cutting through Ankum and Corday's despair. In the past decades of service, it shames me to admit that I have not said this enough. Regardless if there was ever a time, a throne it's knows it's now. It has been an honor to man like this station you. with all of you. And with you, Chief, Davrick said. He was the only one to respond. His own words felt distant, disconnected, as though he was speaking to himself from somewhere far away. His mind was sluggish, unresponsive. His breathing felt labored. A strange, detached part of his mind supposed that he was probably having a panic attack. Crassus had no more orders to give. He simply sat, watching the view screen. Davrick reached out towards his little pic capture of Amelia and Drury, his wife and son, tacked to the side of his monitor. He would see them again, someday. He was sure of it. Doesn't sound like A it. fresh surge of stuttered oaths from Uncum distracted him before he could pull the pict off the side of the display. The Tyranid bioship had filled the view screens. Even as the stunned crew watched, the monstrosity's great hooked chitinous beak split apart. The maw yawned wide, impossibly wide, wide enough, Davrick was sure, to swallow one of Darkin's moons. Its shadow fell across the auger station, blotting out the lights of the stars. 
The structure around them seemed Dang. to shudder, as though its terror matched that of its crew. The view screen now showed nothing but static washed darkness. The bio ship had swallowed them whole. Corday had slumped. Now, I'm going to stop it right there because that just brings me back to like a childhood memory I had. So, uh, I guess this will tell my age. So, before we had like, you know, good cell phones, we used to read books a lot. And one of my favorite books was called Primal Waters by Steve Alton. It is, if you've seen the Megalodon, it is the third book in the series. And my man, old Jonas Taylor, um, well, he's about to get eaten by the Megal Megalodon. And uh, he says, well, if you Megalodon, I'm going to drive my ship down your throat. I'm going to get out of my sub inside your stomach and I'm going to use your own shark tooth that I found to cut out your heart. And that's what my man does. Gets out of the sub in the stomach. In the dark. Pitch darkness. Takes the megalodon tooth that he's got, like souvenir that he found. Takes it out. Gashes open the inside of the, the lining of the stomach. Reaches through and grabs the megalodon's horn and rips it out. Ah. So, so badass. So cool. Let's keep going. Pumped on the deck, shaking and weeping uncontrollably. Crassus was looking down into his lap, a knuckles white, where he gripped the arms of his chair. Ankum had finally stopped gibbering. Serene, he managed to say, looking over at the auger analyst. Serene, there's something I need to tell you. I love you. She continued to stare at the now blank view screen. I love you, Jenny. A sudden impact threw all of them. Davrick found himself spiraling across the deck, almost on top of Corday. The station shook violently. Tremors dislodging rune banks and audio systems. The alarms triggered again across the cramped station. Crassus, who alone had managed to stay in his seat, deactivated them without comment. The view screen had gone offline completely, showing nothing but gray static. They're, they're going to board us, Ankum stammered, as they picked themselves up. Any response was lost in another jarring impact. The station's frame shrieked in protest at the stresses put upon it. With their systems scrambled and broken, it was impossible to tell exactly where they were, or what was happening outside. The station seemed to settle so wait, slightly. The sounds ship... of tortured metal reduced to a low creak. They all scanned Alive? the ceiling, looking for any sign of a breach. Do you hear that? Serene said. It was the first time she'd spoken since seeing the bio ship. They all listened, breath held, straining to hear over the groan of adamantium and Corday's muted sobs. Eventually, Davert caught what Serene had detected, a faint, scratching, scrabbling noise, as though someone, or something, was scraping across the outside of the hull. It mirrored the scratching, tormenting all of them from inside their own skulls. They're on the hull, Davrick said. But before he could go on, a crash shattered the breathless quiet. The section directly above Crassus's chair in the center of the station's cockpit collapsed. With it came a flood of broiling green liquid that struck Crassus just as he looked Stomach up. Stomach ass. If the old sensorium master managed to draw breath to scream, the bio acid flooded his mouth, throat and lungs before he could make a sound. Davert caught an impression of his death as he was lost entirely in the torrent, flesh sewing from bones, organics consumed in a heartbeat. The rest of the crew recoiled, but too slowly. Serene, nearest to the center of the cockpit, was struck by the acidic spray. Dang. Her hands went up to her exposed face, and her screaming filled the claustrophobic space. No, Ankum wailed, lunging across his bench to catch the auger analyst as she collapsed. He managed to drag her hands away from her face, and he recoiled. Still, she screamed. Ankum doubled over and was sick. Davrick, whose station was furthest away from Crassus's chair, scrambled back on top of his bench as the flood of acid spread across the decking plates. Serene had collapsed into the rising swill, her body coming apart. Ankum tried to push himself against his vox banks, but was sick again and collapsed. The bugs got to him before the acid did. There were insects in the hissing, steaming slime, writhing, sightless maggot things with hard black shells. They swarmed around the discolored vomit-like biomatter, the air full of the susurration of their passing as they swiftly covered the deck, the cogitator stations, workbenches, and walls, riding the rising tide of acid. First hundreds and then thousands of them reached Ankum, swarming over his boots and knees and up his arms, where he was crouched against the Vox systems. No. He tried to scream, but choked on his own bile. His eyes rolled back in their sockets as the alien swarm began eating him alive. No, Corday killed himself. No. 
face still streaked with tears, he leapt directly from his bench into the stream that had consumed Crassus. He was gone in an instant, as the breach in the station's hull was burned wider. As uh, Onkum's eaten acid. out remains collapsed into the bioorganics yeah. sloshing around the cockpit's deck, Davrick stood rooted to the top of his bench. He couldn't think. He couldn't move. He was in the throes of panic. A part of him realized he should end it quickly like Corday, but another part was desperate for another way out. Any way that avoided the nightmare bile that was burning away everything. Like I said, it was digesting them whole. Even as the terror kept them in place, Grohl's binary chair collapsed, pitching the unresponsive tech adept into the effluvium. Fluvium. His red cloak billowed for a moment before he was lost, coming apart midst the steaming clouds of liquefied organics. For a moment, Davrick was alone. For a single, ludicrous second, everything felt surreal, ridiculous, almost calm. It had to be a nightmare. None of this horror could possibly be real. You thought. Then his bench collapsed. He screamed, trying to scramble back onto the plasteel's disintegrating remains. No, no, no! The bioacid caught him, sloshing around his boots and his as lower fatigues. His God panicked said, wails quickly turned to screams of agony as the material was eaten bleed. away, exposing his flesh. Davrick died slowly, on his knees, eaten up inch by inch by the bile and the sightless, burrowing things that swam in it. Eventually, the insects flooded his throat, choking and suffocating him as they ate. The acid took all that remained, as another section of the hull caved in to emit a fresh gout of vicious toxins. The picture nah, of Amelia and Drewy fell from the side of Davrick's primary view screen into the flood, and in an instant, the smiling wife and son were gone, consumed entirely. No more pictures. Alrighty, guys. Well, that was Wes Hammer. Five times, Tyranids were beyond horrifying. Oh, freaking bugs, freaking bugs, you guys. Alrighty, guys. Well, that was Wes Hammer. Five times, Tyranids were beyond horrifying. And, I mean, I I would gotta say Tyranids are just horrifying to begin with. I really wouldn't want to run into any one of those Cthulhu-looking monsters. That does not sound like a fun time. Especially one that shoots Psyker hyperbeams out of his uh, forehead. Yeah. Yeah. What? How? How can these these bugs get any worse? And then you got a hive ship that's literally eating other ships. What? What, guys? And then the stomach acid has bugs in it. God. Just just why? And uh, uh, I, I don't get it. But with that being said, guys, like I said before, we're working on this new software, working on the new uh, editing software. We're running new hardware. I'm just kind of now figuring this out. So bear with me as we get over that little learning curve and we'll pump out some crispy videos for you guys. I promise. I promise I do my dang just to pump out some crispy videos. But like I said, I do want to check out some more of the Space Marine Legions. Love to check out the towel. I don't know why I cannot remember the blood is the blood angels. That kind of sounds right. Blood blood angels, yeah, sure. And the space wolves. I want to check them out, guys. But where can I find some good stories, animation on them? And I think it'd be really, really cool if I mean we could see like a orc tyranid, necron tyranid. Eldar versus Tyranid. I feel like that would be really cool to see. I'd like to see a full invasion from the very get-go as the Lick Licksters. I forget. I'm, I'm having brain farts, guys. It's real late. I've been working on this all day. But I want to see some animation. Y'all know where I can find that? Please leave it down in the comments for me if you know where I can find that. Or if you just got some more cool videos you want me to check out. That would be dope. But with that being said, guys, before you head out that door, let's go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. We're almost at a thousand, like nail bitingly close. Not that it really means anything, but we're all, we're almost there. Let's get there together, guys. But guys, y'all have a great rest of your night. Peace, love, happiness to you guys. Hope you have the best rest of the day you could possibly have. And with that being said, guys, always be easy. Love you guys.